Hi, rock and roll community. It's Barb. It's Tuesday, which means it's our Tuesday training tools day. As always, I hope that you are all having a wonderful start to your week and that you had a great weekend. And we're going to jump right back into our training uh, for this month. The theme is observation. So we have talked a lot about our observation and um, and you know the importance of it and all that fun stuff. So let's do this. Here we go. So observation. We're in our final week. It's already the end of February. Can we believe that next week is March? Craziness, I know. Okay. So as a recap, we've talked about the importance of observation. We've talked about how it helps us with behaviors and classroom management and breaking down and really understanding what do children need from us? Um, we've talked about objective versus subjective observation and the importance of that. But that really lets us see what the children's needs are. Um, and our own views or biases are get, not getting in the way when we look at something objectively to help the child or to help a situation within your classroom. But what's so funny is we can talk all day about how important observation is. We've given, given a few examples. You know, we did the whole biting thing. We broke that down. But sometimes, and I remember this when I was a teacher um, and, and I had just started, and it, sometimes it's like, but what, like, what am I observing? It can seem really overwhelming to just think of this whole idea of like, I need to observe to get information. So I thought today we could kind of just break down a couple ways um, to observe and a couple techniques that can help you um, to, to gather the observations in an efficient way that's going to be specific to your situation, your class, and your teaching style because we're all different and our observations are going to look different. Um, but if you're brand new or if observation is not something you've you know, you, you do on a daily basis. Like I said, it can seem overwhelming. And I remember having similar thoughts when I had first started in the classroom. So I thought this might be helpful for, for some of you. So let's focus on some different ways to observe. You know, you can have your ongoing observations. You're kind of just journaling. You're writing down everything and you can use your journal. And I think that's a great tool to use. Um, and just to be jotting down some stuff and you can do it per child or per day and um, just really just getting your thoughts out. And there can be a lot of value in that because sometimes you don't realize how important that like one thing you wrote down what, you know, was. So um, writing it in your journal and getting into the habit of just having these ongoing observations is fabulous. Uh, for some people, or if you're just, you know, depending on your circumstance, you could also just focus on a certain time of the day. And this could be because you're reflecting that like, wow, lunchtime gets a little like a little crazy. <laughs> and it's hard for, for me to, um, you know, to feel present with the children and I feel like it's rushed. So maybe you want to be a little more mindful during that time of the day to see if you can get some more information from your observations, even during a busy time. So maybe you're going to focus on just different times of the day or in the afternoon, like maybe you just need to switch things up. I'm going to observe. I'm going to see what the children like. I'm going to see what's not working and maybe craft up something that's going to work for them moving forward as they get into some different developmental levels and they need different things in the classroom. You could also look at certain skills. We're going to talk about this um, in our next couple slides, but really breaking it down to maybe I just want to focus on this one skill to see where a child's at or to see where all the children are at because I need to, you know, switch up some work. So I want to make a new lesson. And all those always starts with our observations, right? Like we have to, that's where the information lives. So without that, we can't make the new lessons or <laughs> get the new material. So I want to focus on um, more of, you know, um, a, a certain skill. Like we talked about before, specific behaviors when we're trying to figure out what is the child trying to communicate. Um, so maybe you're just going to focus on that behavior and try to break that down through all the techniques that we've talked about in weeks prior. And, um, and or maybe just a specific part of your classroom. Um, this obviously is going to look different for COVID right now, but you could be looking at the shelves and the materials that are on the shelves for our preschoolers who are doing individual shelves um, or for our toddlers and infants. Like, where are they spending the most time? Where are they, you know, not spending time and why? And kind of just observe the actual, you know, the, the environment part of it to see what's happening there and what changes you can make. So if we're going back to those skill sets, and we're going to, you know, maybe break it down into some, you know, sub 
uh, topics here, we have fine motor. So you're gonna be, if you're looking, I'm gonna observe fine motor, I'm gonna be looking at how a child grasps at objects and you know, which hand are they using and how are they holding a pencil and what fine motor works do they enjoy using? That information is going to, you know, help feed into, okay, and this is what I'm going to do next, or maybe I'm going to add this in, or maybe this is a little too challenging for them. Going to give you all that information around fine motor. And you can jump over to gross motor. How are they running and walking? You know, how is their balance? What gross motor skills are they practicing? What are they craving? If they're craving something, maybe they need a little maximum effort. Remember, bonus points if you remember from a previous uh, Tuesday training tools about when we talked about gross motor and maximum effort. And then really looking at like, how does the environment help them with their movement? You know, is it hindering something? Is there, you know, too much space where they're overwhelmed or is there enough challenge where they can have some, um, some gross motor movements uh, throughout their day? You could look at independence. You know, when is the child most independent or when do children need the most assistance? That's gonna, those observations, if you're looking at it for, from that lens, it's going to, again, give you the information of how you can make your environment more independent, what type of things you need to do to help the child be more independent and help, you know, again, set those goals to the child really needs a lot of hand, you know, assistance with hand washing. So I'm gonna, you know, take it step by step to help them be independent, you know, through different, you know, the smaller steps of that big, um, that big task to help them get to that independence. Okay, but you have to first observe that they need that, that, that assistance um, with that skill before you can help put that plan in place. We could look at communication and that's a big one if we're talking about behaviors, because remember, sometimes the function of that behavior is because they're not sure how to communicate either A, that they want a toy or B, how to approach a friend or how they're feeling. So really focusing on the observation of how a child communicates, what's their body language, how do they express themselves? What sounds are they making when they're communicating? You know, if a child is nonverbal or doesn't have many words, but you are observing that they make a certain sound when they're upset or um, about to get upset, and that observation tells you that, that's gonna help you support that child more and give you the information of, oh, maybe I should prompt them to use this language. Maybe I should model more when I'm hearing these sounds that I'm, you know, I can see that that means frustration or, you know, like I said, like getting, um, getting upset. I'm gonna then, you know, give them more supports there so they can be learning what words they can use to communicate how they're feeling or what they need. So again, based on that observation, but then you make the plan after to help whatever you're seeing. And how do they respond to certain communication? You know, some children like they, you know, they, they're really sensitive. So if they're, you know, if they are testing a limit and we respond in a certain way that can make them shut down. And then we kind of lose that learning opportunity. We talked about this, I say this all the time in my Tuesday training tools, because it's so true. We talked about this in another, another session of how we really want to approach the child with that respect and how they're going to respond mo you know, best, because if they shut down and they're not listening, then we're losing that opportunity to share um, what, you know, what we want the lesson to be or what we want the outcome to be. So how are they responding to certain communication, I think is really important to, to pay attention to. Um, we can talk about the cognitive. This is definitely going to help you in terms of your building your curriculum for the works on the shelves. You know, what is the child in, enjoying playing or working with? What works can they complete? That's a really important one um, because we always want to have that balance of that repetition that's so important for children that they can be, you know, going through that mastery stage and, you know, practicing those skills. So they need enough works that they can be um, repeating and know how to do with a balance of works that are, you know, pushing them to that next stage or skill set. Um, so you really want to be observing, like, what are they completing? Who's completing what? How many times a day? Kind of gives you that overall, like, um, that, like, view of, like, okay, what, could, what do I need to put in my classroom? Maybe I want to keep everything the same. Maybe I need to get some more, you know, different works for my classroom. But observing what and how they're interacting with the works is going to give you that, those answers. And that's why we don't have set curriculums. <laughs> that's why we don't just the next month say, and here you go for September because I don't have that information, only the teachers do. And you get that through your observation. And that's why we have the framework for our curriculum that we have because it truly is based off your observations. 
Um, and I think it's also really important to look at, you know, how long are they playing with this learning material or engaging with it? What is about it that they like? We want to be building that concentration. So that's great if they're staying with it and for so many reasons, but what about it do they like? Um, and how can we make extensions from what they're enjoying from that learning material to other maybe lessons or areas of the classroom that will continue to help build that concentration, which is such a key fundamental goal of what we wanna be doing in our classrooms. And lastly, another uh, example would be emotional. You know, their self-regulation skills. How are they reacting to change? When is this child happy or sad or angry? You know, they kind of get maybe a child in a new cycle of this new emotion. Well, what's going on? Are they sad before lunch because they're tired or hungry? Or are they sad at the end of the day because they, you know, it's just been an overwhelming day and it's long and they miss mom and dad or caretaker or family member. Um, looking at the emotions throughout the day, again, gives us so much information. So sometimes breaking it into these subcategories can help it feel a little more manageable when we're talking about observation or what we can observe. So I thought maybe breaking that down would be helpful for you. And just a summary. Um, these, when, what's nice about you know, breaking it down into those categories or on the other slide that I showed here, like different ways to observe, if you can find something, you know, a way that is um, beneficial to you, although it may seem kind of redundant to write down these things, essentially what you're doing is you're becoming proactive about the strategies and the works in your classroom. Um, we never, we don't always want to be putting out fires as a teacher or getting to a point where that behavior is happening or a child is bored of a work. So then they're going to find another way to feel challenged in the classroom. And sometimes that's through, um, you know, a behavior that isn't as uh, ideal, that, you know, or, you know, kind of changed, right? So we, these observations are your proactive strategy and key to keeping things on par and not having to go into that like survival mode or like, oh gosh, this child's like, you know, feeling completely lost about something that's going in your classroom. So getting into that routine, although it kind of feels funny at first, like, why am I writing this down? It's, you're going to realize that once you do get into that, um, that rhythm that's comfortable for you and your teaching team, how important and how much your actual, how much information the child's actually giving you when you break it down and um, start to really look at your observations. And it is your guide. It is everything that it is your information of how you're doing everything in your classroom. Like I said, I can't give you that information because it comes from the child. We can use our philosophy, we can use our frameworks and we can build it into what the expectations at rock and roll are, but essentially the actual information comes from the children, okay? These observations give us the opportunity to see th things through their eyes, which then allows us to better support them and to better understand them. And it serves as a great reminder of where a child is on their developmental path. If we don't observe, we don't know where the child is, we can't really guide them appropriately. So um, we think, you know, this is the information that we're using for our assessments, for any feedback for parents, all that you know, important stuff comes from these observations. Um, but I think the most important is that it's just giving us the tools to help support them and understand these children. Um, we've said in previous trainings that we're their advocates. We're here to help them. We're here to, to support them. So um, they, um, they, need, they need that from us. And we, we help them through our observations. So um, I hope that this month has helped you to have some more techniques and tools for, for your um, for your observations and that you've gotten deeper into that practice and maybe trying something new and using your journals and having more meaningful conversations with your teaching team and your program specialist or your director. If you ever need more resources or have questions about it, uh, please ask, I'm so happy to help. I would be more than happy to continue any extension of what, uh, you know, what I've presented in a Tuesday training tool to help you with a specific situation that you were finding in your, in your learning environments. So with that being said, I hope everyone has a great day. And if you have any questions at all, we're here to help. So I will see you next week. It is a new month, which means we'll have a new theme and so excited to continue this learning journey with you all. Thank you and have a great day.